to welcome everyone to our last Community Research Academy presentation that's uh, going to be done by Dr. Monique Gouchard. I thank all of you for taking this wonderful journey with us. And I hope that you've learned, I'm sure you're gonna learn so very much today from Dr. Gouchard's presentation. And uh, we're hoping that you will give us honest feedback from the entire course. So I like to thank you and I want to thank Dr. Gouchard. But let me just give you, let me just tell you a little bit about Dr. Gouchard. She identifies as a Black Tina. Dr. Mo was born on St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands and raised in the South Bronx. She's an accomplished storyteller, educator, social psychologist, research ethicist and organizer. Dr. Mo is an associate professor of psychology and deputy chairperson at her alma mater, Bronx Community College. She is the chair of the Bronx Community Research Review Board. She's also a board member of the CUNY Center for Lesbian and Gay Studies and a founding member of the Public Science Project. Monique was the principal investigator of the $250,000 Picori Eugene Washington funded Community Engaged Research Academy. Uh, Gouchard has 16 years of experience working in partnership with young people, parent organizers, env environmental justice advocates, and a community-based research ethics review board on mutually beneficial research partnerships. Her work pairs theory, lived experience, and robust ethics to redress scientific racism. Recently, Dr. Mo became a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation New Connections grantee and received honorable mention for the 2017 Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Community Campus Partnership for Health Equity Award. Dr. Mo has several invisible disabilities and is a caregiver for her elderly mother. I will present to some and introduce to others, Dr. Monique A. Gouchard. Welcome. Thank you so much, Reverend Dr. Phillips. Okay. Um, so I'm not so sure if you see the same view that I do. I'm going to move us right over here in the corner. Um, Again, I'm super excited to be here. I'm gonna talk about the importance of community perspectives um, in the CTSC grant proposal evaluation process. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the BX crib, um, all that good stuff. All right. I'm using Google Slides and I put a copy of um, the presentation so you can click around, along with me in the chat. Uh, sometimes Zoom does a weird thing where if you enter after someone pastes something in the chat, you can't see it. So maybe I'll ask Agnes or Kenny to repaste the link. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, this is the part where like, you know, I do a disclaimer and say that all of the things that I'm gonna say are like, uh, not necessarily representative of my uh, academic institution or the, the BX Crib Inc. Um, they're my own ideas. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, all of the claims that I'm going to make, though, are absolutely like rooted in years and years and years of extensive research, um, but also consultative work to lots of community based projects participatory action research projects, um, all that kind of stuff. All right, I just wanna start with a thank you and acknowledgement and bring my folks into the room. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Reverend Dr. Phillips. Uh, thank you, Agnes, thank you, Kenny. Um, yeah, and I'm just gonna thank the members of the BX Crib Inc. I'm kind of violating a rule that we have with the BX Crib Inc. And that rule is that if I'm going to talk about community-based pers perspectives, um, whenever possible, I would bring one of the members with me, but it's 1049 on a Wednesday morning and folks are working, right? Um, so unfortunately no one was available to join me in this presentation, but they did go through my slides, um, that kind of thing. Okay, I am foremost a professor. Um, I'm gonna ask you to be present. I'm gonna ask you to take care of yourself though, right? You gotta take a break. 
Um, you have to make phone calls. You have to care after people. Uh, I'm going to ask you to ask questions in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Phillips, for introducing me. I didn't know if that was going to happen. Um, I will just add that I'm a longtime uh, scholar activist, and I'm a I'm a social psychologist, but I would much rather frame my work as community psychology. Uh, I probably have to move us out of the way again. So I've worked with uh, parent organizers, grandparents, um, with environmental justice folks, with middle school students, um, with international and national projects, and definitely through the Public Science Project. And I've worked with the Bronx Community Research Review Board, which I'll talk about in a little bit for eight um, years. So it's a very long-term relationships. I'm mentioning these projects because I um, want to hold space for being the type of researcher, but also active community member that um, enters spaces in, and leaves them in ways that I will be welcomed back, right? We'll think about that. Think about that in your, in your review processes too. Okay. So don't be like us, us sis here, right? Please interrupt me. I'm used to being interrupted. Uh, I tried not to have a jargon heavy presentation. Um, I would much rather uh, like be, this be dynamic and intimate rather than go through all of my slides. I am probably going to skip a considerable amount of slides in the interest of time uh, because this is the second to last class that I have with my introductory social psychology students at um, 12 o'clock and I gotta run out of here, okay. Cool. All right, so ordinarily, like, um, I try to be a linear story to uh, tell it, uh, yeah, like this, but sometimes I go like that. So I'll ask uh, Agnes and Kenny um, to rein me in <laughs> if I'm starting to wax poetic about something. Okay. All right. Throughout this presentation, I don't know if the folks in the room are familiar with um, what's called radical citation practices, but um, yeah, so nothing that I'm going to say I feel like is new. Um, I see myself in the genealogy, I, like if there's like a family and a history of other Black women feminist scholars who have, have thought a lot about the research process and like the relationship of uh, Black and brown bodies and Indigenous bodies and disabled bodies and queer bodies in research, right? Um, so I just see myself in like the genealogy and like a fam of those folks. Um, I'm going to share this literature review with folks who want to engage in that type of work. But yeah, nothing I feel like I'm going to say is new. Lots of folks have, I'm going to frame it differently, but there are once uh, lots and lots and lots of amazing scholars like Sayada Wallace and, and um, Harriet Washington. Um, and Alondra Nelson, who've talked about the relationships between communities um, differently defined and research. Okay, cool. Um, so I want to give a context to why I think your participation on Wild Cornell's Clinical Translational Science Center as a reviewer is so, 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 so important. I want to bring Maori scholar um, Dr. Lindy, Linda Tuhiwai Smith in the room who's written extensively about how research for a lot of us is a dirty word, right? It's a dirty word because it has an uncomfortable relationship between anti-Black racism, um, between coloniality, between imperialism, right? And Dr. Tuhiwai Smith is talking about indigenous people in New Zealand, but a lot of us feel like she could be talking about Black folks in the United States too. Okay. Um, I want to bring uh, my colleague Susan Wolf into the room who talks a lot about how research ethics, right, like the standards that we sh should have about how folks are treated in research also has a problem. And that problem is um, what she calls and other scholars call white normativity, right, like the person that we're always talking about in research um, most likely is like a white body, right? Or white perspectives are upheld. I'll, I guess I'll give you a tiny example. Um, Reverend Dr. Phillips said that um, I have several invisible disabilities. So I have what's called systemic nickel allergy syndrome, right? Um, it just means that like nickel, the metal, 
I am so allergic to it that I'm allergic to it in food. I'm allergic to it in the air. It is the most ubiquitous chemical. It's everywhere. You can't get away from nickel, right? That means no wine, no chocolate, no nuts, no beans, not most green leafy vegetables, no soy, no wheat, no gluten. So much fun, right? A lot of folks ask me, what is it exactly that I can eat? And I say food, like that doesn't have nickel in it, if that makes sense to you. Um, when I read the literature on what it, so for, there's a lot of doctors that don't think this is a real thing, right? Um, and so there's an emerging literature that's written by people who have uh, this condition. And I think that Kenny and Agnes and Reverend Dr. Phillips have told you that there's like a humongous gap between when research is conducted and how those results trickle down and they actually begin to impact practice, right? So again, I wanna center the importance of like lived and organic perspectives to research and to a lot of the things that you're gonna be asked to review because um, it is as equal and as powerful as the academic slash scientific knowledge that you will be asked to critique. Okay, cool. Um, I wanna bring the Community Campus Partnerships for Health in the room and um, make sure that we're holding space for a dynamic um, definition of community, right? So community just doesn't mean a group of folks that share racial identification or ethnic identification. Communities could be around disease or dish slash abilities or health conditions or age or all of those things at once, right? Um, I guess I, I'm 40. Mm -mm. Um, so I guess that makes me Gen X, but at the same time, it makes me a member of the hip hop generation. It makes me a lot of things, right? So let's always hold space when we talk about community perspectives for dynamic perspectives, right? Um, I was on a reviewer for the CTSC for a while, right? And it was a, a great, great experience. Unfortunately, I had to take a step back because uh, work got real and I didn't want to superficially show up. So I had to step back. And there are times that yeah, that will probably happen to you. And I would just encourage you to talk to the, the organizers like Kenny and Agnes and Reverend Dr. Phillips about um, how you could be present because again, your being there, your offering an outside perspective is so important because you are representing so many other, the interests of so many other folks. All right. so. Um, this is where I'm going to defer to my colleagues a little bit because I wanted to be here for lots of the academy classes, um, but I couldn't because it conflicts with my teaching schedule and my um, obligations um, as a deputy chair on my campus. So should I or can I talk a little bit about like the ways in which community perspectives are needed in research uh, or do you want me to force fast forward that? No, I think you should just, yeah. No, no, go go ahead with it. Okay. So I was talking about white normativity before, and I can unpack this a little bit if, if folks would like, but um, I just want to talk a little bit about, like, again, why your perspectives are so needed, right? Um, a lot of, re so research is reviewed in different ways, right? Um, it's reviewed by institutional um, review boards, which you know, um, are a group of scientists and sometimes one community member that evaluates the project uh, on a, a, a myriad of um, evaluative criteria, right? So like what are the risks and benefits to participation? Are the risks and benefits equitably distributed? Like does everybody got a chance of benefiting? Does everybody have a chance of exposing to risks? Are folks fully informed about what their participation mean, uh, what that means. Do they have a right uh, to walk away without anything bad happening to them? But the issue that a lot of us have with um, IRBs and just relying on that as a way to make sure community perspectives are heard is like, we don't know a lot about the, the diversity and make, the makeup of those review boards, right? A lot of the, the onus of making sure like the pressure rather of making sure that community perspectives are heard is on that one community member, right? Who is usually an unaffiliated with the institution and usually doesn't have the same like degree that the academic researchers have, right? A lot of those folks, because I've done research and talked to a lot of those folks, um, feel like they are out jargoned, right? Like people talk in word salads and 
uh, Reverend Dr. Phillips know I got mad love for Wild Cornell and I have lots of higher ed degrees. And so I'm usually the person in the room that goes, please don't speak in alphabet soup to me, right? Like don't assume that everybody knows what a, a term, like even CTSE means, right? <laughs> right? Like let's unpack vocabulary. Um, I think your perspectives are needed because there are a lot of presumptions about the purpose and theory of change in research, right? I'll say a little bit about that. Um, I, I am a researcher. I've been a researcher for a long time, but I'm also cynical about what research can change, right? What new research can do, right? Research is great. Research is powerful, but sometimes new research is not the thing that we should be doing because there's so much research out there. And if you don't understand what I'm saying, um, I'm a member, I'm a resident of the Bronx for about 39 years. The Bronx is an overly researched borough, like everybody's doing research on the Bronx, right? Um, but according to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's, uh, those health rankings, many of you know, for the past 10 years, we are the 62nd unhealthiest county in New York State out of 62 counties. What has more research done to change that, right? Maybe what needs to happen is to pause on new research and for us to do what's called secondary data analysis and go back on the research that already exists and ask questions of that rather than continuing this treadmill of participating in research, participating in research, participating in research, right? I would argue that your perspectives are needed because sometimes many of us would say that research is not always bene benevolent, right? It always takes people's experiences and shrinks them, <laughs> right? Uh, towards particular ends, right? And maybe we should just say that and figure out how to do research in ways that impacts immediately, as, as much immediately as possible, the folks that we are gonna, that we're hoping to study, right? That changes something about um, the social determinants of health in their communities, okay? Um, I think that there's a presumption that research is always a transaction, right? Like I am a stranger to the researcher. And when you re review these studies, sometimes you'll ask questions about the relationship. Like, let's say someone wants to study something um, and they have no immediate connection, lived expertise with that. You might be in your feelings about just because you have an academic degree does that permit you to do that work, right? Or sometimes when you're doing research for a long period of time, you're gonna develop relationships between the research assistants like Agnes um, and other folks, right? So research is not always a transaction. It, it's relational, which basically means it involves relationships. It's reflexive, like we should always think about our power, how our race, ethnicity, gender, disease, all those things um, impact what we're gonna do. And I always want you to think about, and maybe you would disagree with me, that the decision to participate in research, right? If we follow white normativity, if we follow research ethics says, frames it as an individual one, right? Like my mama had a stroke not that long ago and she was approached by some researchers to get into a clinical trial, right? Um, and we all thought it was like not the time or the moment to be asking my mama when she's, you know, cognitively impaired and, you know, not in her full faculties to make this decision, she called me and was like, please come over here. I was going to say the hospital, but I checked myself and read this consent form and explain this to me. And that pretty much happens to me every day. I know it happens to Reverend Dr. Phillips in her capacity also as a pastor, right? But re the decision to be involved in research is not always an individual one. So when you review these studies and you're hearing that children are the, are the participants or mothers are fathers or persons, like I, I would encourage you to push back um, and say like, this is probably a, like a decision that families are gonna make. And I know that I'm talking fast, but lastly, I will say that sometimes research presumes that the person that we're doing research on is an uninformed person that that person doesn't have their own agency, their own power, um, and that their participation is, on, is only passive. And I always want to encourage you to think about like how decisions to be involved in research can honor the fact that people probably know a thing or two about the conditions that impact them or whatever, um, and that they might want to be involved a little bit more than just being the researched, if that makes sense. 
Um, I'm gonna skip the other slides in the interest of time because I know um, everybody wants me to get, uh, I'm gonna skip this slide too, okay. No, I'm not gonna skip this slide. I wanted this to be a poll question, but Agnes told me that the poll questions ain't really happening like that, right? Um, I do wanna pause and breathe and ask you this question. Um, so again, I'm about to end this part and talk more about the CTSC proce process and the BX crib, but um, I saw on the curriculum that you read about Tuskegee and Miss Henrietta Lacks, and I hope the Ralph sisters and the Kennedy Krieger study and other examples of egregious abuses of by POC people in research, right? Um, I hope that, is that true, Reverend Dr. Phillips, that they have like a research ethics thingamajiggy or no? Yes, 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 they did. They did. Do they have the CTI CT, uh, training or no? Um, no, some of them maybe, some of them yes, but not as part, officially part of this, no. Okay. So I'm all about increasing the perspectives of community folks on that evaluate research on IRBs and at places like Wild Cornell's CTSC. And I want to talk about how this has always been the case. Um, so the way that we, we have rules about how people can be treated in research come from this Belmont Commission, right? How many people... Um, know if there were any non-academic, regular community folk on the Belmont Commission. I'm going to hum the Jeopardy music to myself. None. 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 <laughs> None. <laughs> okay. well, fact, I personally have no clue who's actually on the commission, but I'd guess probably zero. I guess probably zero. None, so. honey buns. <laughs> None. Okay. Um, zero. I Okay, actually, that is not true. These are the members of the original Belmont Commission, right? Um, and I want to highlight this amazing woman, uh, Dr. Dorothea Height, oh, Dorothy uh, who was the president of the National Council of Negro Women, who many folks herald as the godmother, founder of the modern civil rights movement. Um, Dr. Height, uh, had a master's degree, but she was a regular person, right? Um, who just happened to be an extraordinary <laughs> civil rights activist. Um, at the time that she was on the original commission, she had a master's degree. Um, since then, she's been awarded, she was awarded rather because she passed um, several honorary doctorates or whatever. And I also want to bring folks uh, focus on uh, Dr. Pat Patricia King, who was a civil rights lawyer at the time, right? So there were two black women, most definitely, because I've read a lot of writings, their writings and interviews of them, who were always, always, always on a room full of fancy ethicists and philosophers saying, okay, but what about black folks? And what about women? And what about incarcerated people? And what about, and what about, and what about, right? So if you ever feel anxious, like, you are being out talked or being in the room, please always remember Dorothy Height and Patricia King. I was gonna play a little bit of Dr. Height, but I am not going to do it. I'm gonna encourage you. It's gonna probably try to play by itself. So I'm gonna play it and then stop. Yeah. I was gonna play a little bit of her, but in the interest of time, maybe in the after the QA, I'll come back and we'll hear. I'm, I'm Dorothy Height. I knew it was going to do that because it always does that in Google thing. All right. So I want to talk about the BX Crib Inc., right? So. Yeah, excuse me for a second, Dr. Gouchard. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, how do you define beneficence? Okay. What's your own take on beneficence, quite apart from what was dictated by the Belmont Commission? Um, so the way that I always understand uh, beneficence is we should be maximizing good, right? Um, except I will say, I, I think I understand your question. How do I say this? I think that even when we think about maximizing good and, and minimizing harm, that's not enough. I think IRBs are really important. I think that they are the, the tiny bit of like the iceberg that you can see about what we should think about. 
um, when we try to apply standards about how we treat people in research. And I'll give you a definition, right? So for about 20 years, I've been engaged in community-based, but also what's called youth participatory research, right? And that's a form of research where young people are my co-researchers. Like I teach them how to do a survey, how to do oral histories, how to do focus groups, how to do photo voice, how to do something in order to better understand a thing that is impacting them, right? And a lot of times following beneficence, right? Um, my mentor or the IRB will say, well, you can't compensate them too much, right? And a lot of people offer um, young people and others like an Amazon gift card or pizza or whatever, right? That would be following beneficence, right? I'm doing good, I'm offering some compensation, except sometimes it's, it's the researcher should be asking people what they want. Does that make sense to you, right? So when you ask young people what they want, some of them don't want an Amazon gift card, right? Some of them want to go with you to the conference that you're presenting at, and you're going to talk about the work that you did together. Some of them want help developing a resume. Some of them want more money than $25. They want to be compensated, commensurate with how much they are um, giving to the project. So I, I want us to think about beneficence the way that the Belmont Commission and the way that ethicists suggest that we should, but I also want you to think about social justice. And I'm so glad that I mentioned Dr. Hyde because just before she died, she was participating in all these interviews about what can we do next? How can we improve the Belmont report? And how can we make ethics uh, review like more robust? And she talked about justice, right? Like is research about like distributive justice, making sure, like I said before, that everyone has an equal chance of benefiting, but also equal exposure to risk, right? But how can research be wielded as a tool for social justice? Social justice, economic justice, education justice, housing justice, all forms of justice. Does that answer your question? Oh yes, Dr. Gouchard, thank you so much. I'm so glad I asked it. Thank you, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I like again. I would much rather answer your your questions than just talk at you because that's not my C's. I just have a lot of slides because I'm not a morning thinker. I'm not at all, right? So I need to refresh my thing. Okay. So anyway, about the BX crib, right? So the Bronx Community Research Review Board is a board of volunteer Bronx residents, caregivers. Um, patients who care a lot about the work that is done in our backyards, right? We want research to be culturally appropriate, to use culturally appropriate practices. We want research to be fair and ethical and almost immediately figure out how it's going to address health equity, our well-being, and some forms of justice in um, the borough that we call home, right? Um, we also want research to be return to us as soon as possible. And when we say that, um, we mean not in an academic article form, right? So much to research. So a lot of the questions that we ask of researchers is like, what is your plan? Not only who do you bring to the table when you develop your, your project, right? Whose perspectives are come to bear, but also like, how are you gonna tell people who took the time to participate in your study what you did with their results, right? That could be on a Twitter storm. That could be a town hall on Facebook. That could be a Tumblr page or an Instagram page that figures out how you're gonna share findings in ways that are responsive, right? It don't take five years, three years for folks to find out what you did with their results. Um, that could be a conversation, right? That could be like a dinner. That could be like a cookout where you say, thank you so much for participating. Um, we appreciate you know, all the insights that you shared. This is what we, we came up with, if that makes sense, right? All right, cool. So with yes, radical- You know, Dr. Gouchard, it could even be a rap. It could if be you whatever. you want to actually bring it out there. Right, right. But the, but the I think um, what, what happens is like, and I hear my colleagues saying this, right? Oh, I'll send you a copy of my paper. Don't nobody want to read your paper. Maybe some people want to read your paper, right? But we also have to shift academic writing because a lot of it is written in ways 
that is not accessible to common folks, right? So what about pushing researchers to share back their findings and PCORI and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the um, American um, Public Health Association, a lot of different organizations that do um, research in health are wrestling with this right now, right? Like, what is what what can we do to help folks understand what happened in a way that doesn't rely on text? Maybe that's a video. It's a maybe it's a rap. Maybe it's a TikTok. I don't know. But be more yeah. innovative about how we return findings back well, to folks. You know, Dr. Gouchard, as you well know, the donor class, the donor community. Not only do they have skin in the game with respect to the overall specs for any research study, they can condition up front as a condition precedent to the grant that the timetable and the format, the platforms for release of mm -hmm. the metadata, of the research, must be newly translated. That's what I hear you saying, doctor, Absolutely. that we have to reimagine the way that the research is made real. What are the deliverables? Yes. But the donor class, again, can dictate those terms, but only if there is a recognition that they have a capacity mm. and a responsibility to do that. And I believe that push up comes from yourself and your colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really appreciate you you bringing that um, perspective to bear. I was not aware of that. Um, I, I do have a colleague um, who uh, is involved in um, kidney research or whatever. So I, I'm going to bring that back to the crib and talk about that a lot. I, I wish it just wasn't restrictive classes of participants that kind of had that self-determination. I wish more folks would be, um, would, would uh, have space to say, this is what I want you to do with my, my findings or my results. And I know that a lot of initiatives, a lot of entities are pushing for like what's called a repository or an archive, right? Um, where presumably participants can like look at their own data with um, and compare it to other folks who might have the same con conditions, but there's also a learning curve to that. Yeah, so most definitely making things, returning findings to folks who are impacted as fast as possible. Okay, so I'm gonna go over this quickly because I, I wanna uh, end soon and just do a Q&A. Um, thank you, Jessica facts, like too much jargon, right? I have multiple master's degrees and a PhD. And sometimes I say to my colleagues, because I think the academy teaches you that the way that you demonstrate that you're smart is that you speak in esoteric words that don't nobody know, right? And actually, maybe we can decrease that wide gap between when wonderful research is done and when your physician understands hey, this new thing is happening. I need to change the way I speak to my diabetes patients, right? If we get folks involved as consumers of research, right? Not just increasing their health literacy, which everybody and their mama wanna do, um, but also about getting fo folks more actively involved in other parts of the research process. Thank you. So yeah, so the BX Crib, we try to transform what we see as a top-down culture of research, like folks are doing research on us and we try to increase the capacity of folks who are often research, right? By teaching them about research, the language of research, by teaching them about um, ethics. We wanna protect our community. Um, like I said before, by promoting the return of findings, we wanna insist on shared ownership of the benefits and the projects, products of research, right? Like this is where we don't want your $25 Amazon gift card. No, thank you, right? Um, maybe we want access to our own data so that we can write our own paper about how we've interpreted it. Um, and then we also provide healing-centered education to Bronx patients by having a very similar um, research academy. Okay, basically we see ourselves as loving gatekeepers to make sure that 
um, what we call research predation, right? People just doing research on us, but our health uh, conditions and social determinants of health persist, right? We see ourselves saying, no more that, right? And indigenous nations have done this too, right? There are some indigenous nations that have their own tribal IRBs or their own community-based review boards that have called for moratoriums on research. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide and come back to it a little bit later. Um, so what kind of questions does the BX Crib ask? And then I'm gonna transition to um, what I understand mostly from, from Kenny about the CTSC um, grant review process, which follows the National Institute of Health review process. So the BX Crib, we are about to become a federally recognized IRB, but again, we see IRB as a tip of the iceberg. So when we ask questions of researchers, just like you're gonna do, right? We ask like, what are your research questions and why do you think they're important and important to whom, right? Like if you have a community partner, you as a researcher may have a question, but what might your community partner, like what kind of questions might they have that may be different from yours? Um, what kind of methods are you using? I'm sure that with throughout this academy, you've learned that it is so difficult to divorce the racism of particular research, the racism, um, transphobia, homophobia, sexism, of how some, how some research methods have been used um, from the method itself, right? So I said I'm a social psychologist and most social psychologists use experiments, not this one, right? I think experiments are an interesting way to explore cause and effect relationships but I know that experimentation is a site of trauma, humiliation and exploitation for non-white able-bodied peoples. And so when I think about using them, I think about that history. So who are you incorporating when you do this research? What is off limits in the research, right? Like, do you wanna know everything or have you held space for things that you can't know? Who, do you have a relationship that you've um, aired out with folks? We ask questions like that. We ask, how do you want to adjourn the project, right? Are you just going to tell folks, thank you, you, you filled out my survey, um, you participated in an interview, peace out? Or do you have a plan to honor, again, the participation of folks um, and share back something? Like, how do you plan to end the research relationship is what we talk about when we talk about adjournment, okay? Um, I think the BX Crib has taught me like ways that we need to embrace and love all of our communities. So in your review process, I would also encourage you to think about how the proposals may be upholding ableism and ageism and xenophobia and homophobia and fat phobia or any kind of hatefulness. Okay, so this is where I need um, Kenny, Agnes, and Dr. Reverend Dr. Phillips to pinch hit for me. Because what I did was basically take apart the um, review process application. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Is that cool? Yes. That's fine. Yes. That's fine. OK. So one of the things when you, you get, uh, when you were asked to be on the uh, um, review a project, you're going to have to look for it's what's called the significance of the project, right? And a good way to think about that is like, what is the important problem um, that this project aims to address, right? And what are what if any impediments or barriers have there been to making progress on that problem, right? Um, you're gonna think about, is there a song, strong premise to doing it, right? Is, is this catch-up research? You know what I mean by catch-up research? Like a lot of research sometimes is like, I'm doing this project to demonstrate that ketchup is red. We know that ketchup is red. Why? Let's do something different, right? So what are the, what are the merits of the project, right? Um, you wanna ask questions about the aims, right? But how is what the project um, aimed at improving something, right? Improving our scientific knowledge, improving how particular techniques are performed, improving clinical practice, right? Um, and then you wanna, think about the impact and at the same time that you're thinking about significance. I hope that is clear. And this is definitely the part of the presentation where I'm going to encourage you to ask me as many questions as possible. Um, as I remember from Kenny, 
that um, you will be paired with like a researcher mentor um, that will help you guide you through this this uh, um, review process, right? So you don't have to memorize these things and you don't have to think that you're gonna do these things alone, right? But I think the big one is, is, this, is there an important problem that this uh, project is addressing? And important to whom is something else I want you to think about too. Okay. What is happening to my screen? That is so weird. Hmm. Okay. Secondly, you should think about the overall impact, right? So you'll do like an impact score. I'm going to get rid of the chat for a second. You'll do like an impact score where you think about like if the what are the about the pros proposed project rather can be sustained or how can it be influential to to the field in which it's trying to explore a problem. I, like I, I, maybe this is too abstract, so I'll give you an issue, right? I've learned from other nickel allergy folks that if I take some vitamin C before I eat something that's rich in nickel, um, I don't get the eczema flares, um, the respiratory symptoms, the tiredness and the fatigue that comes from my exposure to nickel, right? So I learned that from patients. And then later on, I actually found a study that talked about that. And because I'm a researcher, the type of researcher that I am, the type of patient that I am, don't you know that I took that study to my dermatologist? <laughs> I was like, you told me that I was crazy. Can you tell your other nickel allergy patients that they should thinking, think about upping um, their doses of vitamin C? Not a lot, because too much vitamin C have, does bad stuff to you, right? Use your imagination, right? But again, think about how something can influence the field, uh, impact practices, all those other things, okay? And the question maybe that centers all of this is, does the project that you're reviewing fit the criteria? Because there are different criteria for the awards and, and um, I didn't include the slide from the criteria. I don't know if Kenny, Agnes, or Reverend Dr. Phillips wants to interject here and talk about the different ones, but I know that there's like a community engagement award um, and then there are other awards. Do you wanna stop me and insert those things too? No, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you go ahead. You'll let me go ahead? Okay, cool. These slides. Um, you're gonna be asked yeah, to evaluate. Go ahead. Okay, you're gonna be asked to evaluate the credentials of the researcher, right? Should they be doing this study, right? Do they have the appropriate expertise, the appropriate training, the appropriate methodological um, background, theoretical background to do that, right? Now, on their team, maybe one person doesn't have that, but maybe put together, they do have that expertise, right? And sometimes projects will be proposed by junior or young, younger scholars in the system. Sometimes they'll be proposed by senior um, investigators. Right. Okay. Google Slides is like not letting me live. All right. So you're also going to think about innovation, right? So this sounds a lot like these are not mutually exclusive, right? This sounds a lot like um, impact to me, right? But does the proposed study and the the application try to problematize or shift what we currently understand as like base practice, right? Is this special? Think, of, uh, think about innovation, right? Are the concepts or whatever new to the field, right? Um, I read some really interesting proposals where I think I, I remember reviewing this garden project um, where folks were partnering with both young people, the teachers and the parents um, and I thought that their mode of consulting and their, their method of making sure that they honored multiple perspectives with understanding um, food insecurity was innovative, right? Or is it just like doing, uh, adding to stuff that we already know, right? Um, does the project represent some refinement, some improvement or new application of burgeoning or emerging concepts or, um, in the field, right? Okay. And then lastly, you want to think about the approach, right? Is this the appropriate approach, appropriate method, appropriate outreach, appropriate whatever um, that matches the aims, that can accomplish rather the aims of the project, right? 
has the researcher explained in clear detail to you that this approach is the appropriate one that will um, harness whatever outcomes they're trying to do, right? And are there problems in that approach, right? Okay. Um, I'm gonna give you a copy of this slide. I'm also gonna stop there because I felt like I threw a lot of things at you um, at once. And I hope I did justice, Kenny, Agnes, and Reverend Dr. Phillips. I didn't talk about the environment, but I know that it's 1130 and Agnes is about to side eye me and tell me to stop. <laughs> do a Q and A. Okay, so I know uh, Larry said something in the chat earlier. Uh, oh, okay. Said, yeah, you use the term relationship. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Uh, right. I've never heard of anybody talk about a research relationship. Mm -hmm. and if you come out of a white lab coat, chrome and glass kind of research, you mm -hmm. have a research with a white lab rat. Mm -hmm. You're doing social science. I do. Critical concept there. I think it's just as valuable, but probably harder to translate. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we want to do COVID research, if we want to look at COVID long haulers, which is something I'm interested in, mm -hmm. and the sensitivity for dem broad demographic reach, being good with the communities, being collaborative. I get that. Mm -hmm. Hard to do when, do when you're drawing blood and you're thinking about people who are dying from COVID. But I think it's a core concept. I've never heard before expressed that way. I know maybe I'm, I'm, I'm late to the party. No, I really, really appreciate that. Um, I will tell you as someone who is on a delayed fertility journey, Larry, that is an entirely emotional process, um, oh. that most reproductive endocrinologists need to learn a thing or two about relationships. Can I say that? And it's the- Like radiologists, they should never be near a patient. No, they shouldn't. Um, but it's the phlebotomists who are the most empathetic, nurturing, or, like folks as they're drawing my, uh, their uh, folks' blood or whatever, um, in just a kindness, in just a responsiveness, and just a how you are feeling today, um, that works too. But I appreciate your comment. Oh, so I'm sorry, Kenny, that I didn't talk about the grading system. I'm sorry, go ahead, Agnes. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it, it's Ms. Scanlon. Sorry, Dr. Gushart, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. Uh, your comment about the Bronx brought back to mind the so-called cockroach study. Mm. Are you a hit to that? The NIH, the National Institute of Health, funded the so-called cockroach study in the South Bronx. The mm. null hypothesis, is there a relation, there is no relationship between the preponderance of children presenting with asthma attacks in ER rooms throughout the South Bronx uh, and the presence of substandard housing conditions. Mm -hmm. And of course, the presence of cockroaches disproportionate within the housing stock of the South Bronx was an absolute corollary and impactor and raison d'etre from both the uh, medicine and the scientific perspective for the disproportionate presentment of kids in the South Bronx with asthma. So pediatric asthma had taken root in the South Bronx, wanted to know why the, again, because of the droppings of cockroaches on floors, kids at, at small, their size being so close to the floor, they were breathing it in. Mm -hmm. But with you by way of saying picking up on your points earlier this morning what impact did that have what significance did that have beyond the paper and the archives it had zero impact in my opinion okay because no one in the community the local city council member at the time the local state senator, the local assembly person at the time, didn't immediately run with this report mm. to demand that there be public hearings in public places, get input from the community to create mm. laws, to require owners of properties, both private 
and NYCHA to ensure the eradication. There was no zero cockroach plan 2005 Hmm. because there was no hookup, no relationship, no conversation, no dialoguing between the community, their public representatives, and the ivory tower. So Hmm. that triage, that disconnect of those players has seen the ongoing preponderance of asthma rates in the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. Because history, it doesn't know any better than to repeat itself if people don't do good disruption. Any comment on that about the role of the political class in being held to the fire? I mean, beyond signal boosting some of the things that you said, I think what happened with that study was complex. And I do agree with you that um, community forums, even when I use the term of community forum or some form of returning uh, findings back to impacted people can take a lot of different forms, right? As community psychologists use World Cafe, they use so many different things, right? And um, sometimes it's meaningful to concretize what we mean sometimes it's just enough to have a commitment to say, I am going to do this thing. I do think what you're saying is further complicated by what we know about redlining in the Bronx, um, by what we know about abandoned open lots in the Bronx, right? So, and and about the relationship between um, landlords and tenants, right? Um, So, Yes, (laughs) Yes, <laughs> community perspective was needed to say, you, you can't just do this thing, right? That puts the onus maybe on the tenant, right? Clean up your apartment, um, uh, buy, I don't know, rat traps and raid and, and all those things like that. You do have to connect it to the larger structural um, issues. I would hope that all research uh, would do that. Um, uh, the BX crib is getting a lot of requests from community folks to talk for, for us to talk to them about whether or not they should take vaccines, right? Um, and on the crib, we have IRB administrators, we have one of the chief epidemiologists of the, the New York City Department of Health, and we have regular folks that don't got no degree, right? And we, we all have different positions on this. Um, and what we do is kind of like what you suggested, right? Let, like, let's map the impact. Let's map all the folks that need to be involved in this rigorous conversation about how vaccination needs to happen, but the relationship building, the wrestling with racism, the wrestling with not having relationships or not being listened to, that's going to need to be worked out if this is going to work. But I, I appreciate that history that you shared with us, Ms. Gamlin. Thank you, Dr. Kushal. Mm-hmm. What's implicit in what you're saying is something radical, that it may be part of the responsibility of research as an enterprise to also educate. Absolutely. When we listen to somebody talking about how useless is it to measure to an additional decimal point or two of precision the effect of roach droppings on asthma if the politicians don't do anything, fine. But if they fundamentally don't know science, and in this case, if they're not willing to listen to scientists, mm-hmm. where's the point of doing this great research when the Yahoo that's hearing it can't read, won't think, won't listen? This is an educating mm-hmm. component. For, for, flip it, not just to politicians. If the community is not only the subject, or you have a relationship with the community, mm-hmm. but they're also educated that if part of the project is to teach so they can understand. Mm-hmm. You make the point, if the jargon so thick you can't read the article, well, maybe part of the issue is help them read the article, not to abandon the ability to read. Absolutely. I agree with you, Larry, but also exercise some humility and understanding that there's intimate knowledge on the thing that you're trying to study, and, and you need to listen to folks who have lived it, too. You know, it's mm. like directional education. I wish that could happen, right? I, I really do wish that happened. Um, I can briefly share a back to back, back to my relationship with my wonderful, that, that was me being facetious, um, reproductive endocrinologist, right? I remember my first visit shortly after I was being scheduled for uh, a laparoscopic uh, procedure, right? 
and it was early in the morning. And if you're not an early in the morning person, you should not do early in the morning appointments, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> I wasn't usually my clap back fire self, right? And I just remember being so overwhelmed to hear the amount of fibroids that I had, the sizes of fibroids, and then being told that I was having surgery. And then when I went home, because, you know, we have these wonderful apps now that allow us to correspond with our doctor, I kind of wrote him a scathing response that said, I'm sure this course of treatment is appropriate, right? But I also need you to know that Black women are seven times more likely, insert citation, to be... <laughs> Uh, to be told uh, or subjected rather to surgical interventions for their fibroids than anyone else, right? Uh, and then I just went on and relied on uh, some resources that I know that try to be mediators between researchers and regular folks to say that the way that he treated me was wholly inappropriate, right? Um, and provided some literature that he should read should he encounter <laughs> other patients. So yeah, I, I hear what you are saying. Um, but a lot of that's a lot of work that we and but it is the most necessary and urgent work, Larry, because are we doing research to impress our colleagues and, and for esteem? Or are we doing it so that it has legs and impact into the world? It's 1141. So I probably have time for one more question. And Reverend Dr. Phillips, Kenny and Agnes, I hope I did what I was supposed to do on my end. Yeah. Well, if there's any more questions, I can send them your way and then we'll see what happens from there. Okay. Well, I wanna to say to you, thank you so very much for a very informative and thought provoking presentation that will, I think will stay with us for a very, very long time. And I think it will really have an impact on those who review uh, our grant at our table. So, and that it was the whole focus of this entire program is just to educate our community members as to how to evaluate uh, and appreciate research from a different perspective. So I thank you so very much. And if anyone in the community has a question, send it to us and we will pass it on to Dr. Bouchard. Thank you so very, very much and all the best in everything you. that you do. Thank you. I appreciate it. I will call you maybe tomorrow. I hate to okay. run, um, but okay. like I said, my students are in a difficult situation and um, I will, uh, Agnes has a link to my presentation. You can also share my contact information. I'm very responsive via email, especially because the semester is winding down and I cannot wait to return to doing reviews when my life is less complicated. <laughs> Take care of yourself, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. you Thank you. too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I thank all of you. I have to tell you, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do with this course is to pair all of you with a researcher and um, get you to do various projects or just talk about those projects. And things didn't quite work that way. But if you do have ideas, um, send them our way and we'll talk about it. Uh, we are gonna do this class again. So uh, we're gonna have an evaluation for the entire program. And I'd like for you to give us your input and let us know how we can make it better, how we can improve it. Um, and if we have to make it a little, little longer, we can do that as well. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking with all of you and hearing your ideas. Uh, I will be sending out a certificate of completion to you from the CTSC. So I thank all of you so very, very much. Have a wonderful, wonderful day and just keep in touch and, we're gonna, and just send me ideas and we'll talk, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Just said, uh, 